Okay, this is 101 week five, part four. Um, bottom of page eight. So Socrates is going to now talk about love and what makes love good. Um, in order to do that, he's going to be talking a lot about the soul uh, because he believes love affects the soul. Um, and so he's going to need to define the soul, which is a tough thing to define. Um, I realize that this next part, what happens next is that Socrates' explanation of love is basically a whole other mythology that he's just made up. Um, and it's strange to be in a class like this, which is supposed to be nonfiction. Um, it's supposed to be philosophy. is a nonfiction topic. But Socrates is talking about crazy mythology in which we do not believe. Um, in fact, a lot of my students don't believe in the existence of the soul. Um, most mod- a lot of modern day people don't believe the soul is even a thing. Um, uh, it's not necessary that you believe it to read this. I'm not trying to convert you into believing everything Socrates says is true. In fact, later on, it's going to turn out that Socrates doesn't even exactly believe what he says. We'll, we'll talk about that more um, in a little bit. They're metaphors. It's a way of thinking. It's not exactly right, but it's a type of thinking. Um, what I will give you, so you may not believe in the soul. Um, and that's fine. It's a completely reasonable thing to think. Um but it's but I just want to get actually I'm going to talk about this a little bit now. Um, Socrates is going to be talking about the soul and sort of the the way love affects the soul, and he's going to connect it to the gods and reincarnation. He's going to bring up all this crazy shit. Um, it's a way of thinking. Telling stories and doing mythology is a type of thinking. It's a type of philosophy. And it is true that these are things, things like reincarnation and the soul, and the, he says the soul has wings, and it's also got horses, and it's a whole crazy thing he's going to say. Um, but it's important to understand that if you've ever taken a psychology class, and someone, I don't know if you've heard these terms about the ego, and the superego, and the id, uh, the superego is sort of the part of your brain that tells you um, what to do to be a hard worker. The id is the part of your brain that wants you to like drink and eat and have sex and party and ignore the rules. And your ego is you. It's kind of trapped in the middle between these two forces. You have a voice in your head that tells you to do the right, you know what the right thing to do is, do it. You have another voice in your head that tells you, just fuck off, go party, have fun. Um, there's also the unconscious, which is sort of where some people believe dreams come from. Um, but unconscious thoughts that you can be angry about something and then you ever get mad about somebody about something little like the dishes, but then you're really angry about like their whole life. Like you've been angry at them for months and it just comes exploding out in the dishes and they're like, why are you yelling at me about the dishes? And you're like, I'm angry at you, but it's a, because it's bigger than you, you think it's about the dishes, but then it turns out to be about something else because you were unconscious of it. You were pushing it down into your heart or into your brain or whatever. Um, and so it came out over the dishes, but you weren't really mad. And you think you're mad about the dishes, but if you really stop and think about it, it's not the dishes that made you mad. It's like the whole situation of, say, how bossy they've been for months. So when we talk about these things, the id, the ego, the super ego, the unconscious, right, all this stuff, you can't find any of that shit with a microscope. Those are not scientific concepts. They're ideas. They're good ideas. I like them. I like the idea of the unconscious. There are things you know that you don't know you know. So you'll be angry about something and you don't know why, but some part of you knows why. It's the unconscious part. It comes out in dreams. Um, you can't find any of that with a microscope. Uh, it's not, you can't prove the existence of the unconscious. You can't prove the existence of a super ego or an id. They're not scientific ideas. Um, it's a kind of mythology. So is this. Um, and I guess one of the things I want to point out is a lot of the stuff that's useful in, say, psychology departments is a type of mythology. It's a way of thinking, and so is this. And I tell you this because you're going to have an instinct when Socrates starts talking about crazy shit like the soul there are two horses that pull the soul towards heaven and reincarnation and this and that. And you're going to feel like this is crazy. Um, but it's not really more crazy than a lot of the things everyday people believe um, about, say, psychology. Um, because in both cases, you can't prove that they exist. And I'm not saying they do exist. I'm saying it's useful to think about it as if they do for a little while. Um, because it can help 
answer questions. It can help solve problems and it can keep your brain headed in the right direction. Um, and so Socrates' mythology here is a bit like that. So I just, I want to do that as an introduction before you start, because you're going to, some of you guys are going to feel like this is a crazy thing to study in class, but I'm not asking you to believe the mythology is real. I'm not asking you to believe in the existence of the soul. Um, I just, it's, it's a word. And actually, and I think I've said this before and forgive me if I'm repeating myself. Um, Socrates will talk a lot about the soul and how it's affected by love. The word soul comes from an ancient Greek word. I'm sorry. Let me try that again. Um, the words, what's what the word soul that appears in this book, um, the ancient Greek word for soul was psyche. Well, that's interesting. Um, the P-S-Y in psyche is where we think of words that you know in English that have P-S-Y in them. Psychology, um, uh, psychopaths, uh, psychic powers. Um, it really means the mind. They translate it as soul, but it's really important to remember that the Greek word for soul is connected to the English word for mind. Psyche is your mind. Psychology is the study of the mind. A psychopath, pathology is disease. A psychopath is someone that has a diseased mind. Um, psychic powers are mind powers. Um, so it's just, it's, it's worth realizing that he will keep saying soul but the ancient Greek word is psyche. So you might want to think about it, not like a religious soul, but a little bit like just like the thing you study in psychology, the mind. Um, okay, cool. I think that was a was a good intro to Socrates' speech. I think I did a good job with that. All right, let's go. So the soul. Now Socrates says, the soul through all her being is immortal. For that which is ever in motion is immortal, but that which moves another and is moved by another um, in ceasing to move also ceases also to live. Okay, um, this is some very intense, crazy philosophy that's in the next paragraph. We're not doing this. Um, I'm going to zip right past it. Only the self-moving, never leaving self, never ceases to move and is the fountain and beginning of all motion that moves all besides. Now, the beginning is unbegotten, for that which is begotten has a beginning, and the beginning is begotten of nothing, for if it were begotten of something, the begotten would not come from a be- I'm not doing this. But if the unbegotten, it must also be indestructible for the... Uh, okay. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm skipping this shit. <laughs> I'm going to turn the page, and I'm not doing this. Um, it's a kind of philosophy that we really do not need in this fucking class. Um, the basic idea is that if I push a chair right? If I, if I push a chair, the chair didn't move itself. I moved the chair, right? I'm the one that caused that to happen. And then the question becomes, okay, what moved me? Um, Socrates's answer is the soul. Um, the soul is the thing that does the moving, um, not the thing that is moved. And there, there's a kind of philosophy called ontology where you kind of study shit like this, that and you go, well, wait a minute, where did the souls come from? Well, they must have an origin point. Well, because because if, if something moves your soul, right, then what is where what's the thing that move? Wh- where did where do the souls come from in the first place? And 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 if, if the soul moves the chair, then what moves the soul? What created the soul that moved the chair? And if you follow it back long enough, they were like, okay, that's God. Um, and and then they get, that gets into the the thing that has no beginning and no end because it, it, it origin some, some, if there's movement in the universe, it had to start somewhere and they concluded it was God. And this is the kind of thing that we don't, I'm not doing that. We're skipping this whole paragraph. Um, so this is this, and at the top of nine, you've got the, he, he says at the end of that paragraph, enough of the soul's immortality. So this is a, a, a conversation about what makes the soul immortal. You just, you don't want to do this. But if the self-moving is proved to be immortal, he who affirms that self-motion is the very idea and essence of the soul. Ah, I'm not doing it. Um, self, but the point is this self-motion versus other motion. You push a chair, I'm doing them. The chair's not moving on its own. It's moving because I moved it. Um, and so then what moves the whole universe and you get to God and the immortality and things that, things that move themselves are immortal, the soul, God, and things that are moved by other things are die. Like the chair can be destroyed. That's a, it's a, I'm not doing it. Okay. In fact, I'll pick you up on the next video because we're definitely not doing any more of that nonsense. All right. I'll see you then.